Hi, this is Greg Gornert of Gornert Wealth Management, and this is my Insights and Perspectives podcast. Welcome to the July 15th edition of my Insights and Perspectives podcast. In this month's Business Owners Toolkit segment, we'll be focusing on growing your business with author and business coach, Eamon Percy. Eamon Percy, if you could go back to the beginning, 20 years ago, what's the one piece of advice you wish you could have told yourself? I think about that a lot, and I set some pretty big goals. Global equity markets last week were dominated by U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's testimony before Congress. Powell seemed to downplay recent strong June job numbers and instead emphasized his view that concerns about weak global growth and trade uncertainties with China are continuing to weigh on the global economy. His comments led to expectations that the U.S. Fed would continue to lower its benchmark overnight rate at least once more in 2019 as a precautionary measure. Now, U.S. equity markets continue to rally and have probably moved up into an overbought territory. I wouldn't be surprised to see a pullback in the not-too-distant future. Well, my guest today has held multiple senior leadership roles with top global companies, Powertech Labs, which is a division of BC Hydro, Ballard Power Systems, Pirelli Cables, and Ford. He's also led the successful turnaround of two global companies in manufacturing and engineering, returning both to significant profitability and strong working capital positions. He is a media commentator, columnist, and founder, and president of the Percy Group, which is a leading business advisory firm, and has just published his first book, The 1% Solution. Welcome, Eamon Percy. Thank you very much, Greg. Thrilled to be here. I'm so glad to have you out here. Now, Eamon, this is a business toolkit kit segment, and it's designed you know, really to help business owners as they grow their businesses. Um, what pitfalls do you see on a regular basis, and, and what advice could you offer them from, from the external viewpoint that you often get? Sure. So I work with executives, entrepreneurs, and business owners of mid to large size companies, and typically manufacturing or industrial products uh, companies. And it's terrific because you get to work with the leader that's driving the change in the organization. And most companies, there's a veneer of what they're doing, and then I get to pull the curtain back and see what really is happening and then help somebody make a change. And there's really three areas that I see the greatest pitfalls of these business owners and entrepreneurs. And by the way, these are already high-performing business owners and entrepreneurs. Well, that's that's the thing a lot of us don't realize, or I recognize it, but a lot of people don't realize just how we constantly have to up our game. And even successful businesses, you can see them failing in different areas. And uh, it's those little things that they're not caught can cause big problems. A hundred percent. And these are very motivated men and women, and they're looking to take their performance to the next level. Yeah. It's not as if they're really needing to fill in some big gaps. It's yeah. They've got great businesses already. The business businesses are performing at a good level, but they want to go further. Or the world is changing in some way. Yeah. Or it's a family business, and there's an intergenerational transfer of knowledge and skills. So that Those are typically the scenarios I get involved with. So there's really three things that I, that I see. It's, it's personal, process, and people. And by personal, I mean uh, the greatest pitfall I see with executives and entrepreneurs is when they spend more time working on other people or working on the business than they do on themselves. So they don't really have the internal awareness or focus that they really need to continue to work on themselves as a leader. And they're very focused on their team and the business itself. So that's number one. That's under personal. I'll go through them and then we can uh, go through it in more detail if you like, Greg. The second one is around process. Even larger companies still tend to scale with people. They tend not to scale with business processes or systems. And that might work in the early days, but it doesn't work in when you get to be a larger company and it's more competitive like it is today because you need to be focused on margins, you need to reduce those cycle times, you need to improve customer satisfaction, and that's all about running a very clean, systematic, and value-added 
process. And you see that a lot today with e-commerce and other companies. And the third one is a general category called people. And there's a lot of challenges with people. It's about getting the right people into the organization, holding on to the right people, knowing who to promote and who not to, and then building that executive team that's going to execute against your vision. So it's really all about the personal aspect, specifically leadership, the process, and then ultimately getting the right people. Interesting, because the first thing that you said that stood out to me is that you have leaders and leadership that focuses around about on the people around them rather than focusing on themselves. Maybe expand upon that a little bit, because I think a lot of times we all fall into that trap where we're like, oh, if I just fix you, things would be so much better. Right, right. Yeah, if it's just everyone else. <laughs> just, yeah, just, well, if the rest of the world Marriages can get, don't work that way either. <laughs> if the rest of the world can get their, their, their stuff together, yeah, wouldn't that be great for me? Awesome. Yeah, it'd be awesome. But the reality is this gets magnified when you're in a business, especially the executive or the business owner, because those small, and it's both positive and negative, but those small attributes of an individual or a leadership get magnified throughout the organization. So where in a smaller business, it may be something you can overcome. In a bigger business, it actually can become quite a detriment to moving the business forward. And I'll give you some specific examples. We all have natural uh, areas of interest and attributes that we focus on. Sometimes under stress, especially for a CEO, that CEO will go back to that area of focus. Maybe it's operations. Maybe it's product design. Maybe it's HR. Whereas what they need to do is focus on where the greatest need is. So they may not have sufficient self-awareness to understand that they need to work on themselves at times of stress, in this particular example, to be able to focus on where the greatest need is. A lot of them, or many of them, are not necessarily, even though they operate at a high-performing level, they're not necessarily engaged in a very consistent, long-term program of personal continuous development and leadership development. So over time, the world changes and the business changes, but they don't su sufficiently change along with it. Not all of them, but, but many. And they become surrounded by people that, that may be supportive and like them, but the market may start to shift or might start to be disrupted, especially today with so much going on. And they're not well equipped to understand what they need to do individually to make that change. Interesting. So would that take the form of like peer coaching? Because I, I think the other thing that, that tends to happen, especially in leadership roles, is, is uh, they get siloed. They get isolated. And uh, you can't talk to your competitors about what's going on. And so, you know, th there's a there's a, a worldview that, that if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, and I have seen it myself, or um, you, you tend to begin become static and uh, and as you said, the world moves on. So what are the people that are successful um doing to avoid that fate? Yeah, so the successful people, number one, they're aware of it. And and the, then the very successful are aware of it and take very specific action, knowingly, even if that action is difficult or painful. And you're right, you can get siloed because you may not necessarily want to share every bit of detail with your board, depending on the dynamics, nor every little bit of detail with your executive team. Sure, you can go home at the end of the day and you can speak with your spouse or your partner about the challenges, but there's not a whole lot they can do other than provide support. Mm -hmm. So there's a risk that you become more siloed rather than focusing on what do you need to do specifically. So uh, peer groups is a great way to do it. After awareness, uh, peer groups is a great way to do it. Finding people on your executive team that can support you, the right people. I've had a specific tactic where with one company I formed what I called a kitchen cabinet, and there was a group of people in the organization that weren't necessarily on the executive team, but people that had the personality that would tell me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. Well, yeah, because there's two types of people in the world. There's people who will tell you what you want to hear, and there's people who will tell you what you need to know. Right. And, and that depends on the person, too, on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you have to be very careful about yeah. getting that right type of person. So yeah. seeking out that person or those people, and I found that very helpful because often on executive teams you may get the dynamics of uh, there's always a political element. So the executives that, that seek out that. Also, I found executives that are very good at looking outside their business, outside their business model. So many of them, and what I encourage the, the companies that I work with is to you know, take time, travel, uh, go see other companies, understand what's changing, seek new ideas. And there's a whole variety of different ways you can do that. But the main point is to make sure you continue to focus on what you do need to do personally in order to make yourself a better leader. Mm -hmm. There's a lot around mindset as well, too, which we can talk about. But specifically, it's finding those ways to break away from your traditional daily routine and engaging with people that are going to help you 
see what you need to do differently, and then doing that over a long period of time. Interesting. So that would lead into the process part that we're, we're, we're tending to expand upon mm-hmm. a little bit. Uh, when you look at process, if you're a business owner, you know, a lot of people say, well, I've got a business plan, I've got a mission statement. When you think of process, what does it mean to you? I know what it means to me, but how, how do you define that and how, how granular would that process become? Uh, likely vastly more granular than most people can possibly imagine. Uh, I've seen and worked with some exceptionally well-run businesses, and the level of detail they get down to in terms of understanding how they create value and deliver value to that customer is extraordinary. And there's lots of known examples we can talk about, but to answer your question very specifically, the companies that do it well look at all aspects of their organization and they focus on what creates value for the company. Mm-hmm. For, pardon me, for the for the customer right. in the end. And if they're engaged in activity that's not creating value for the customer, they ask themselves why, and if there's no good reason why you're doing it, you pull it out. Right. What tends to happen is companies go through a business life cycle. So I'm sure you and your listeners are familiar with the S-curve of starting as a startup company, and then you go through a high growth mode, and then the S starts to level out, and then you mature, and then ultimately you either die off or you start a new S curve. Mm-hmm. And the goal is to make that leap at the top of that S curve onto a new S curve where you become a different company. So as these companies go through these stages of growth, let's say from the zero to five, and then five to 20, and 20 to 50 million, those three examples, they're actually becoming different companies at each stage of that life cycle. So what they need to do to be successful is they can't scale up and do the same things that they do at the zero to five level, and expect to be successful at the 20 to 50 level. The ones that do will scale up with people, Mm -hmm. and they will scale up inefficiently. And it doesn't mean that people are bad. It just means that what took one person to do at five million, you now have five people, but that's eating into margin and competitiveness. So along the way, you can either get disrupted and changed and try to put in more systems, or you can take us, what I encourage my clients to do is to take a systems mindset So any aspect of the business, as you're growing and growing revenue and then flowing it to the bottom line, keep asking, what can I do to make this more systematic? Now, that doesn't mean a bad experience for the customer. Quite the contrary. It means a better experience for the customer. And I would think a more consistent experience as well. Consistent, exactly. And then consistent, predictable business function, and then ultimately cash flow, which is increases the value of the, of the business and the enterprise. Yeah, because I always look at that on my side, that, that consistency breeds confidence and confidence breeds trust because you know what's going there and and uh it's just so important especially as you as you grow your business wise you know, we've got a detailed business plan in fact i get laughed at quite often about how grand you like and get to and wh- who's doing what and who's doing where but yeah. that's the only way to be in my mind well and if you're getting laughed at because you have a business plan that's too granular that's a good thing in my world that means you're doing something very right yeah. And uh, the level of detail that the companies that I work with go into, not necessarily the CEO, but he or she has to drive that detail into the organization is quite high. Because what happens is as you're delivering value to the customer, if you're looking at it from the customer's perspective, you need to know what's most important to the customer. And it may seem like a small thing within the organization, but it could be a big issue. Uh, to the customer. So for instance, I uh, recently worked with a company that was having some challenges around labeling, mm-hmm. given all the changes that are underway right now, as I'm sure you know in your business, with the tariffs and exports, and we're in a globally connected economy. And that relatively small item, because it wasn't systematic enough, was causing a significant material impact to the business. So what I encourage uh, companies to do, the CEOs, the business owners, is to take a step back and to start to building a pillar of a process-driven organization. It's just one of many pillars. There's, There's people, there's culture, there's a lot of other aspects to it. But start thinking about how can I systemize everything that I'm doing and ultimately that will unleash value and enable you to scale more quickly. Mm-hmm. And I can talk about some specific tools companies use if that's helpful as well. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to hear specific tools. Um, the other thing is, when you're, when you're dealing with companies, do you ever get any pushback from, from people going, why, why do I need to do this? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and, and what forms does that take, and, 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 uh, and how do you kind of walk them through this? Because I, you know, a lot of guys are hard-charging. I mean, I'm just using guys as a, you know, yeah. a, a, a general. Yeah, that. But, um, you know, I, I've had people describe businesses as... You know, 
look, they're rocket ship commanders, and they've got a dashboard in front of them, and they see if something's on that dashboard, it's flashing yellow, that gets all their attention, they deal mm -hmm. with that, and then they run across to something else. And But if it's not on that dashboard, it's just, it might not even be even there. So sometimes I, I think that uh, uh, you might get some pushback from people going, well, why do I need to do this? I've already got this. Yeah, I, I, I get pushback for sure. And what makes me different is I've actually run companies before. Mm -hmm. So not just worked in a company or been at a senior level. I've been the person, the leader at the top of the organization that's run it. And so I can look across the table from this man or woman mm -hmm. and say, I've been where you are right now, and I understand precisely what you're going through, and I understand the nature of the pushback. Right. The pushback might be fear. Yes. Quite frankly, manifesting as pushback. It may be lack of understanding. It may be lack of awareness. You just don't know. And we all tend to be fearful about things we don't know. Or maybe you do know, and you just don't want to do it. Well, there's quite that frankly. too, yeah. And, um, or maybe you, you know, you want to do it, but you don't think it's going to work. Now, does that, and that brings up a good point. Cause you know, say there's a company that it's kind of gone to a life cycle. Maybe the, the, the founder has gotten to a certain age where he's not really sure he wants to put in that extra mm -hmm. level. So how do you deal with companies like that, that, that are probably in that, that edge of maybe, you know, over the next five years going away, they don't need to go away, but mm -hmm. you're in a situation where, uh, there's there's a real danger there with the with the leaderships that have gone. Hey, this is the way we've always done it, and they're mm -hmm. they don't realize it, but they're they're thinking about the golf course. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I call that the success trap. And there's analogies in your world, in the financial management world as well, too. That there comes a point where you've done well, and you've earned uh, a certain amount of monetary satisfaction yeah. and assets. But if you rest on your laurels too much, you may actually increase the risk. From, so from a business perspective, um, there's not sufficient reserves in the business. So what I tell owners in that situation is, okay, first off, you have to think about what are you trying to do here? What's your legacy? If it's a family business, are you transferring it to the next generation? And if so, what's your expectation and how do we build in reserves to make sure that what you've built up so far is protected, number one, mm -hmm. but nobody just wants to... Uh, flatlined it, but then we have to grow it at a second level. Mm -hmm. So back to your pushback question, sometimes that's the nature of it as well too, or sometimes the world has moved on and these individual owners don't necessarily see how the world has changed and they can't put it in terms that relate to the business today. And there's just so much disruption going on right now, uh, uh, Greg, that it's not only sectors that are being disrupted, but even companies in more traditional industries are still being disrupted. You start looking at millennials in terms of how they're being uh, hired and the view that they have. So you can have a very traditional, stable business, but you need to hire younger people. And if you're not understanding how to change it, you're being disrupted in some way. I tend to believe that virtually every company today is a technology company. Most just don't know it yet. Right. They think a tech company is Google, but in actual fact, it's them being disrupted by technology. So when that man or woman is sitting across the table and giving me pushback, I start with my own experiences, and then I help them understand what's the nature of the business, where are they on the life cycle, and what do they need to do to get it to the next level. Okay, so so you were going to mention earlier, walk me through some specific strategies you use to, to help uh, business owners and entrepreneurs in these situations walk through this. Sure. So there, there's three. So number one is I have them articulate to me their business plan, their vision. I go through a, a template. It's called a balanced scorecard. And it has a vision, mission, strategic objectives of the organization, the uh, how you're going to achieve those objectives, strategic goals, and then the initiatives and measures to make it happen. And it's an integrated approach. So I start with asking them, show me your plan. Now, you'd be surprised how few people have the level of detail grant plan that you mentioned earlier. If they don't have that plan, that's them starting to become self-aware that they're missing a, an individual piece. That's right. number one. The second thing I do is um, there's a gentleman here in town who does a terrific job in terms of leadership and management assessments. Mm -hmm. I highly encourage them to go through that process. I, I'm not in, it, have any interest in, in what he does uh, financially, he's just a really terrific person at doing that. And he produces a report, and it's often the very first time somebody's had that level of third-party outside objective feedback on their own individual personality traits, their skills, 
and it has something called a management potential indicator, which breaks down numerically how good are they as a manager, and often it's not what they what they think. So I, I seek third-party outside uh, information. The third thing I do is I expose them to other aspects of either sectors or businesses that may not have experience with. I either do that with connecting them with other people or we'll actually go visit another facility and they'll see for themselves. And often that opens up their eyes to the possibility that's what's out there. Because Now, that, you brought up a good point because I've noticed that too, that entrepreneurs are remarkably willing to share what works with them and what doesn't work with them. They, they're very open and, and it's like... It's, it's like we're all on the same team, and you, a lot of them will really want to help them. And, and because I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of business groups and and peer peer group and peer coaching, mm-hmm. um, because you've learned far. First, it's it's far more fulfilling, and second, you learn far more from from the other people doing, not even if it's your own, in your own sector, but just seeing what people are doing and mm-hmm. uh, and what you can adapt to yours. That, that's uh, I think that's something that we don't always recognize is just um, how generous with their time that other entrepreneurs can be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why my number one list on the three pitfalls that you asked about is personal, personal leadership development. And if you can reach out to other entrepreneurs, business owners, they'll be extraordinarily helpful because they want, they know that they may need the help someday as well too. So that's, I facilitate that. Plus there's, there's more formal groups that do that. There's mastermind groups that do that. And quite frankly, for a larger company, a very high-functioning board will do a terrific job of supporting the CEO in that environment as well, too. And I've had the good fortune of being in those environments, and it's really terrific. Some private companies that don't have a traditional board will set up an advisory board, yeah. and they'll operate as that function as well, too. But it ultimately comes back to the individual entrepreneur to ask themselves, it's not what I know, it's what I don't know. And if I don't know it, what is the risk and how bad could that be on my business? Or, the flip side... What is the potential opportunity that I'm leaving on the table? Mm -hmm. So what I do is I'll bring that perspective to the organization, help them become aware, and then together we'll work on a plan to execute and making it happen. Interesting. So vision, mission, walk through the other two that you had in your... On the balance scorecard? That was a balance scorecard, yes. Yeah, so it starts with the vision of the organization is what's your purpose, what's your why, why are you actually doing this? And that's always fascinating. It's something I'm very passionate about personally. Is that Simon Sinek, the yeah, start, start yeah, with why? Yeah, and it's a, great, it's a great reminder. Like, why do we do what we're doing? And for a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs, it's, it's really to make a big difference. And I like doing that because I get to help other people achieve their why. Yeah, that's, that's a, my, my very favorite, um, or at least one of my, my favorite um, TED Talks is uh, Simon Sinek's, you know, uh, Start With Why. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. It's I don't know how many tens of millions it is, but yeah. it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So it's, it's the vision, the, the why. The mission is, is what's our, how we're going to achieve it, and then what are the strategic objectives of the organization. So you may want to dominate your market. You may want to focus on innovation. And then from there, what are the goals? You have to have business goals, three to five year time frame. And then it gets down to a narrow time frame. The balance scorecard is great because it has four foundations and it, you know, around you know, customer, internal processes, financial, and then um, your organizational capability. What are the actual projects that I'm going to put in place to make that happen? So it's very much like a pyramid, which is the top. We're, we're creating value or we're, we're achieving our, our purpose. And then we're creating value for the companies. And then underneath, the whole organization is pulling in that direction. So really good leaders, when I keep going back to the personal side, they have a unbelievable obligation, not only to themselves, quite frankly, to the customers, but to the employees and their families and the communities to really get this right. So if there's areas individually that they need some help with, and again, this is not remedial, that's, these are high performing. For you to end up at the top of a large organization, either a family business, a public company, as an executive, you have done many, many things right. But even at that point, you have to stretch a little further. So by starting with that personal side and achieving the best you can possibly be by using these specific tools, you're making a big impact not only in your organization, but in your family and your business. Interesting. No, that, that's that's so important. Um, I want to just touch on it because you, you just finished a book, and I really want to. Now, the book is called 
the 1% solution and uh, why don't you the talk one, a little bit more about sure. that? Sure. So I wrote a book a couple of years ago. It actually, so but yeah, what, it, first it, off, what started you wanting to write the book? Because uh, <laughs> you've got a great story. I know how, how you made yourself finish the book. But Yes, <laughs> yes. Finishing the book is, uh, coming up with the idea to start a book is easy. Oh. Anybody could do it over a cup of coffee on a Saturday morning. Actually <laughs> finishing the darn thing. Totally the other exercise. So I started the book because my daughter, I went to university. I have three kids. My eldest daughter went to university a few a years ago, a number of years ago now, and she actually asked for some insights along the way. So I wrote her a short letter um, with some suggestions as to what to do. After the letter was finished, I started thinking about the letter, and I realized I had suggested to her some things to what to do when things were going well. But the reality, Greg, as we know from this week and the volatility around the world and the chaos we're seeing, that doesn't happen all the time. So I wrote her a second letter about how to persevere. And I kept writing and writing until I wrote this book. It's 370 pages long. Wow. I'm an engineer, so I get obsessed. But I get, <laughs> get something in my mind, it's, it's like, it's, it's got to be done. So I went over the top. It's 370 pages long. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the 100 habits that took me from starting in the stock room. I worked as a, a stock room, I guess a stock boy was the term mm -hmm. back, in, back in the day. I was broke, C student in high school. Yeah. Things were really rough. And uh, had an epiphany at one point in my life, and I document this all in the book. And then I embarked on this journey, became electrical engineer, got an MBA in finance, and then worked my way up through the corporate world. So when I wrote this book, I wanted to start doing something that was meaningful and starting to give back, um, because I'm in that phase of my own career where I want to help others along the way. So it's been great. It's been a great experience. Um, I it gives me a chance to share it with a lot of other younger professionals, yeah. uh, mostly. And it uh, became an Amazon bestseller last year. It's available on Amazon. Uh, and it's called The 1% Solution and available today. By the way, just uh, before I forget, 100% mm -hmm. of the profits from the book, by the way, are going to my foundation, and which gives all the money to student scholarships in STEM. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I'm not earning anything out of this book. This is all about part of my own purpose and part of my own way of giving back. So if somebody goes to Amazon, buys a book and Kindle or hard copy, I don't get any money out of it. It all goes to the foundation to help out kids in STEM because my electrical engineering degree early on made a big difference in my life and I want to help somebody else along the way. So now what's the feedback on the book been so far? Is this something Terrific. you bring up to Yeah? Is this something you, you, you bring to your coaching clients or do you or do you because I know you're part of a lot of mastermind groups and, and yeah. that. So what We'll walk a little bit about the, the feedback. Sure. The feedback has been fantastic. And, and mostly when people come to me and say, I read your book and I gave it to my son or daughter and they did X mm -hmm. and it made a difference. That's to me the most gratifying aspect of it because uh, as we talked a bit about earlier, we all have this veneer in our world. We want to project that things are going well all the time. The reality is something different. Everybody has struggles, and we're all trying to work together and figure this, this thing called life out in some way. So when I get feedback from people that it's made a meaningful difference in their life, I find that very gratifying. That's interesting. Though. And I mean, that, that's so important as well. Um, now, is there one particular tip of the book that, that resonates the most with people, or is there something that kind of comes out, or what's the, you know, if you're going to take out two or three ones that everyone goes, oh, that's the one. Yeah, so uh, there's a hundred habits in the book, right. and it's broken down to two or three pages, but the, 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 the core message of the book, the 1%, is that if you want to be successful over a long period of time, you don't have to do one thing 100% better every day. You have to do 100 things 1% better every day. So in other words, um, you have, if we have these big, fantastic goals that we want to achieve, and it can be particularly challenging, especially today for a younger person. I mean, the world is different now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, for one, a young person that really wants to make a meaningful difference, sometimes it can seem overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest in the book is to take that big goal and start to break it down piece by piece. What am I going to do this year? What am I going to do this month? What am I going to do this week? What am I going to do this hour? So the idea that if you just work a little bit better every day, that the cumulative uh, compounding effect of that can really be quite staggering over periods of time. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to companies about this, it's a similar process within a company because you can take this 
um, these improvements that may seem individually small within an organization, saving a bit of money here, getting the right person there, but it can actually add up and make a big difference over, over time. So that's the one thing. It gives people a sense of, it gives them hope in one hand because they can achieve big goals, but it's also very, very specific. Like I get right into what to do, how to start your morning, how to build passive income streams, how to set goals. What are the four way, best ways to set a goal? Like very specific things, because that's what people find most helpful. Interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's all those habits. Cause, um, I have a lot of habits. I know part of it has got to be my uh, my background. Before I got my economics degree, I went to music school, which a lot of people don't know that. But that means I grew up practicing every single day for two hours. I see it with my son now when he plays trumpet. Um, you don't get better every day, but you do a little bit, and it's almost that one percent. And you just—it's that res- relentless pursuit of perfection, as, mm-hmm. as, as Lexus would say. But it—it gets—it gets through. Uh, and sometimes you feel you're getting nowhere, mm-hmm. but you know. But then you fall back on that process. In in my, in my world, that's the way I feel. Um, so I gotta take a step back. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, you—I you, mean, you—you said you're a C student at a high school. Mm-hmm. Now you end up getting an electrical engineering degree, mm-hmm. and then you got your uh, master's in fi- your MBA. The MBA, yeah, from so, Rotman, U of T. So, what brought that all about? Because that's that, I find that I mean, obviously you're you're incredibly successful now uh, as a business person. You're right. You've seen some incredible companies, but walk me through how that that evolved. Because I think that's just as interesting a story as as this. And I, I, no disrespect to to what you do, because I think that's a, that's incredibly interesting, but. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the man and, and how you got to this part of the journey. Sure. So I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm actually an immigrant to Canada. I was born in Ireland. Okay. Um, but lived in Canada virtually my entire life. And the son of two absolutely terrific parents that came to Canada to carve out a better life. And we ended up in Vancouver. Actually, we Toronto, the Calgary. And they kept going west until they hit the water. <laughs> it stopped there. <laughs> okay, we can't go. To, but maybe we could have gone to Victoria. But we couldn't go any further. So they stopped when they came to Vancouver. Yeah. Carve out a life for us here. Um, we actually, you know, with, there were seven in the family. We had a tough start, like a lot of immigrant families. Even today, we lived in a motel on the Kingsway uh, for about six months. And when I was in grade four, and that was really my introduction to Vancouver, uh, both my parents worked very hard, ended up moving us into a great neighborhood, and I went to a great school. My parents actually worked hard to put me into a private school, and then in grade 10, being 16 years old, I had all the answers, so I elected to pull myself out of that private school. Which, uh, yeah, as, as they say, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So things um, went poorly from there, uh-huh. and um, it was three years after I graduated from high school, I was working at a um, London Drugs as a, as a stock boy, and poor student, no money, no resources, And you don't realize when you're young that things can change so dramatically. And I think this still is in my mind to this day, which is why I don't like, um, you know, for companies to get too comfortable. Because that's it. You never know what can happen. Well, there's that whole concept that um, mastermind group that I'm part of that that brings up on a constant basis that the scariest place to be is in your comfort zone because every day your comfort zone gets a little bit smaller and you don't realize it. So the goal that we always strive for is to always want to be uncomfortable. That right. means we're trying different things. And, and that's the, the thing because it, the comfort zone, it's a nice warm place, but it gets smaller and, and your world closes in around yourself and you, you, you're isolated. That's exactly yeah. it. And the world can close in. And if you're a CEO and you're becoming too comfortable, the world's starting to close. That has a big impact on a lot of other people. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that I do to this day is I have a a list of goals and what I go through every morning. And in order to keep expanding my comfort zone, every day I try to do something that makes me afraid. Every day. Now, these aren't big, like I'm not bungee jumping every day. (laughs) (laughs) So Skydiving at seven. (laughs) But we are in a pretty tall building here, so maybe I'll give this one a try. Uh, But it's just the idea of what's new and what's different and how can I expand. So I went through this experience when I was young where I had this epiphany. One night I was at a, at a, uh, a party and a number of my friends who'd gone to from high school straight to university were coming back and they were three months from graduating. And, um, it just hit me like a ton of bricks because right. all of a sudden I'm, you know, life, three years have moved on. Life moves fast. And you're life like, wow. moves extremely fast. And here are these men and women getting degrees. So I, I had an epiphany 
I went home that night and I pulled out a piece of paper and I wrote five big goals. I document this all in the book, by the way. Okay. Um, and there's a personal uh, story in there. I wrote five big goals and I immediately the next day embarked on achieving those goals. And one of them was to get an electrical engineering degree and the other was to get an MBA. Now, at the time, I had grade 10 math and I had no idea how at all. <laughs> so how did that work? Uh, yeah, it was tough. Right? How, how was, how was cal- calculus at that point when you kind of left? Like, <laughs> well, I didn't realize that electrical engineering is basically math. Yeah. In actual fact, I found out when I was in the program that I only needed to take two more courses and I would have had a dual degree, one in math as well, too. So I didn't know that at the time. So, so how did you how did you accomplish that? Did you get tutors? Like what, so what I did started you go to on school? A, I started on, I, I, I ended up going to BCIT first mm-hmm. and then BCIT, terrific organization. They had a program where you could transfer the credits to Lakehead University in Northern Ontario, which is actually where I went to engineering school. Okay. But when I started BCIT on the Monday, Mm -hmm. I realized by the Friday that electrical engineering just wasn't for me. And I was starting a four-year program. But um, I was the first in the family to go to university. I'd made these commitments. I'd written these five goals, and I'm a very goal-oriented person. So stuck with it for four years and finished the entire program. And it's like a lot of things. Once you get into it, it actually does tend to get easier and more familiar, Mm -hmm. back to the comfort zone. Um, and then I ended up finishing that that program at Lakehead, came back to Vancouver for a few months, and then started my career working in Toronto, and then worked at the Ford Motor Company in the electronics division. By this time, I was a little older because I had been uh, three years later starting school, so I didn't graduate until I was 25. So I started working at Ford, big plant, electronics division. I gave myself a goal of getting a promotion at every 18 months, and I was really hungry at this point, Greg, because it, it had been a slow start. And I started to get traction. I was starting to get some wins and su- some successes. Yeah. And um, so I, I liked that idea a lot. I moved up the ladder fairly quickly at Ford, and then I was recruited to run a fiber optics uh, communications company here in Vancouver in Surrey called Pirelli Cables. Right. It was a $70 million a year business. We were losing a lot of money. And uh, with the management team, we turned it around, and we made it one of the most profitable uh, businesses that Pirelli had That's fantastic. at that time. And um, going through many of the techniques that I had learned at Ford and I still help companies with today. And from there, I was recruited to uh, Ballard Power System and was there for five years as a vice president. And then I started a consulting business. At, pardon me. Then I, I yeah, took some time and I ran an advisory business. And then uh, about 10 years ago, I spent a few years working at uh, running Powertech Labs, the for-profit division of BC Hydro and had a great experience there, great people, great company. A lot of people don't know BC Hydro actually owns a for-profit company. It's one of the top utility engineering and research uh, organizations and companies in North America, and uh, really helped put that on a good financial footing on a strategic uh, approach. And then I decided at that point that I had a good long run in the corporate world, starting with that night at the party and a lot of drugs, ending up doing what I do today, which is uh, coaching uh, CEOs and business owners. I also sit on boards and I write um, books like we talked about. And uh, this year I'm launching a course at the Vancouver Club uh, for business owners and executives and entrepreneurs as well, based on what I do individually on a one-on-one basis. So it's a great career. So it started tough for sure. Mm -hmm. So if there's any younger people in your audience or people that have young kids that may look like a challenge, just to think about the long game and put it in perspective. And by the time that entire experience was finished, that's when I wrote the book, and the book documents that experience. Interesting. Now, since you're here, and you might have answered this already, but I try to ask everyone this. Eamon Percy, if you could go back to the beginning, 20 years ago, what's the one piece of advice you wish you could have told yourself? That is a great question. And, And I think about that a lot. And I set some pretty big goals, but if there's one piece... It would be to set my goals even bigger. Interesting. Uh, and and what, re- what does that mean to you, set them bigger? Because when you're a young person, you don't have a full understanding of how you can transcend the difficulties around you and transform yourself as a person. You, 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 you achieve the goals that you're capable of at that time. And if you have limited skills and contacts and resources, that's what your goals will be. So the objective over this long career is to transform yourself into someone else that can achieve big goals 
that you can do something worthwhile with those big goals. By what? Right. That's, that's the end game, doing something worthwhile. It's not achieve the big goals for purely financial reasons. It's what can I do with that? So if there's one thing, and I set some pretty big goals, and I'm very happy with mm-hmm. my, my career. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing now. I really love working with, with entrepreneurs and CEOs. But that's the one thing I would do. If you said, Eamon, what's the second thing? I would, which you didn't, but if you did. I, I, I want to know. <laughs> I would say to uh, never give up, no matter how hard it is, and to constantly persevere. Yeah. Everyone gets knocked down. All the time, yeah. Yeah. Getting back up is the important part. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Eamon, it was fascinating having you out here for, for this interview. Um, you've got some wonderful insight, and I hope you come back and join us again sometime. This was this was awesome. This was Eamon Percy. Thanks very much, Greg. I really appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and visit us on our website at greggorner.com. That's G R E G. G-O-E-R-N-E-R-T dot com. Thanks again.